The Odyssey of Homer. Book 11. Odysseus, his descent into hell, and discourses with the ghosts of the deceased heroes. Now when we had gone down to the ship and to the sea, first of all we drew the ship unto the fair salt water, and placed the mast and sails in the black ship, and took those sheep and put them therein, and ourselves too climbed on board, sorrowing, and shedding big tears. And in the wake of our dark proud ship she sent a favouring wind that filled the sails, a kindly escort, even Circe of the braided tresses, a dread goddess of human speech. And we set in order all the gear throughout the ship and sat us down, and the wind and the helmsman guided our bark. And all day long her sails were stretched in her seafaring, and the sun sank and all the ways were darkened. She came to the limits of the world, to the deep flowing oceanus. There is the land and the city of the Sumerians, shrouded in mist and cloud, and never does the shining sun look down on them with his rays, neither when he climbs up the starry heavens, nor when again he turns earthward from the firmament, but deadly night is outspread over miserable mortals. Thither we came and ran the ship ashore, and took out the sheep, but for our part we held on our way along the stream of Oceanus, till we came to the place which Circe had declared to us. Their Pyramides and Eurylochus held the victims, but I drew my sharp sword from my thigh, and dug a pit, as it were a cubit in length and breadth, and about it poured a drink offering to all the dead, first with mead and thereafter with sweet wine, and for the third time with water. And I sprinkled white meal thereon, and entreated with many prayers the strengthless heads of the dead, and promised that on my return to Ithaca I would offer in my halls a barren heifer, the best I had, and fill the pyre with treasure, and apart unto Teresia's alone sacrifice a black ram without spot, the fairest of my flock. But when I had besought the tribes of the dead with vows and prayers, I took the sheep and cut their throats over the trench, and the dark blood flowed forth, and lo, the spirits of the dead that be departed gathered them from out of Erebus. Brides and youths unwed, and old men of many and evil days, and tender maidens with grief yet fresh at heart, and many there were, wounded with bronze-shot spears, men slain in fight with their bloody mail about them. And these many ghosts flocked together from every side about the trench with a wondrous cry, and pale fear gat hold on me. Then did I speak to my company and command them to flay the sheep that lay slain by the pitiless sword, and to consume them with fire, and to make prayer to the gods, to mighty Hades and to dread Persephone. And myself I drew the sharp sword from my thigh and sat there, suffering not the strengthless heads of the dead to draw nigh to the blood, ere I had word of Teresia's. And first came the soul of Elpena, my companion, that had not yet been buried beneath the wide-weighed earth, for we left the corpse behind us in the hall of Circe, unwept and unburied, seeing that another task was instant on us. At the sight of him I wept and had compassion on him, and uttering my voice spake to him winged words, Elpena, how hast thou come beneath the darkness and the shadow? Thou hast come fleeter on foot than I in my black ship. So spake I, and with a moan he answered me, saying, Son of Laertes, of the seed of Zeus, Odysseus of many devices, an evil doom of some god was my bane and wine out of measure. When I laid me down on the housetop of Circe I minded me not to descend again by the way of the tall ladder, but fell right down from the roof, and my neck was broken off from the bones of the spine, and my spirit went down to the house of Hades. And now I pray thee in the name of those whom we left, who are no more with us, thy wife, and thy sire who cherished thee when as yet thou wert a little one, and Telemachus, whom thou didst leave in thy halls alone, forasmuch as I know that on thy way hence from out the dwelling of Hades, thou wilt stay thy well-wrought ship at the Isle Eerian, even then, my lord, I charge thee to think on me. Leave me not unwept and unburied as thou goest hence, nor turn thy back upon me, lest haply I bring on thee the anger of the gods. Nay, burn me there with mine armor, all that is mine, and pile me a barrow on the shore of the grey sea, the grave of a luckless man, that even men unborn may hear my story. Fulfill me this and plant upon the barrow mine ore, wherewith I rode in the days of my life, while yet I was among my fellows. Even so he spake, and I answered him saying, All this, luckless man, will I perform for thee and do. Even so we twain were sitting holding sad discourse, I on the one side, stretching forth my sword over the blood, while on the other side the ghost of my friend told all his tale. Anon came up the soul of my mother dead, Anticlea, the daughter of Autolycus the Great-Hearted, whom I left alive when I departed for sacred Ilios. At the sight of her I wept, and was moved with compassion, yet even so, for all my sore grief, I suffered her not to draw nigh to the blood, ere I had word of Teresia's. 
Anon came the soul of the Bante Regis, with a golden scepter in his hand, and he knew me and spake unto me, Son of Let's, of the seed of Zeus, Odysseus of many devices, what seekest thou now, wretched man, wherefore hast thou left the sunlight and come hither to behold the dead and a land desolate of joy? Nay, hold off from the ditch and draw back thy sharp sword, that I may drink of the blood and tell thee sooth. So spake he and I put up my silver-studded sword into the sheath, and when he had drunk the dark blood, even then did the noble seer speak unto me, saying, Thou art asking of thy sweet returning, great Odysseus, but that will the God make hard for thee, for methinks thou shalt not pass unheeded by the shaker of the earth, who hath laid up wrath in his heart against thee, for rage at the blinding of his dear son. Yet even so, through many troubles, ye may come home, if thou wilt restrain thy spirit and the spirit of thy men so soon as thou shalt bring thy well-wrought ship nigh to the isle Thrinacia, fleeing the sea of violet blue, when ye find the herds of Aelios grazing and his brave flocks, of Aelios who overseeth all and overheareth all things. If thou doest these no hurt, being heedful of thy return, so may ye yet reach Ithaca, albeit in evil case. But if thou hurtest them, I foreshow ruin for thy ship and for thy men, and even though thou shalt thyself escape, late shalt thou return in evil plight, with the loss of all thy company, on board the ship of strangers, and thou shalt find sorrows in thy house, even proud men that devour thy living, while they woo thy godlike wife and offer the gifts of wooing. Yet I tell thee, on thy coming thou shalt avenge their violence. But when thou hast slain the wars in thy halls, whether by guile, or openly with the edge of the sword, thereafter go thy way, taking with thee a shop en or, till thou shalt come to such men as know not the sea, neither eat meat savoured with salt, yea, nor have they knowledge of ships of purple cheek, nor shop en oars which serve for wings to ships. And I will give thee a most manifest token, which cannot escape thee. In the day when another wayfarer shall meet thee, and say that thou hast a winnowing fan on thy stout shoulder, even then make fast thy shop en or in the earth, and do goodly sacrifice to the Lord Poseidon, even with a ram and a bull and a boar, the mate of swine, and depart for home and offer holy hecatoms to the deathless gods that keep the wide heaven, to each in order due. And from the sea shall thine own death come, the gentlest death that may be, which shall end thee foredone with smooth old age, and the folk shall dwell happily around thee. This that I say is sooth. So spake he, and I answered him, saying, Teweges, all these threads, methinks, the gods themselves have spun. But come, declare me this and plainly tell me all. I see here the spirit of my mother dead, lo, she sits in silence near the blood, nor deigns to look her son in the face nor speak to him. Tell me, prince, how may she know me again that I am he? So spake I, and anon he answered me, and said, I will tell thee an easy saying, and will put it in thy heart. Whomsoever of the dead that be departed thou shalt suffer to draw nigh to the blood, he shall tell thee sooth, but if thou shalt grudge any, that one shall go to his own place again. Therewith the spirit of the prince Teresius went back within the house of Hades, when he had told all his oracles. But I abode there steadfastly, till my mother drew nigh and drank the dark blood, and at once she knew me, and bewailing herself spake to me winged words. Dear child, how didst thou come beneath the darkness and the shadow, thou that art a living man? Grievous is the sight of these things to the living, for between us and you are great rivers and dreadful streams, first, oceanus, which can no wise be crossed on foot, but only if one have a well-wrought ship. Art thou but now come hither with thy ship and thy company in thy long wanderings from Troy? And hast thou not yet reached Ithaca, nor seen thy wife in thy halls? Even so she spake, and I answered her, and said, O oh my mother, necessity was on me to come down to the house of Hades to seek to the spirit of the Bante Regis. For not yet have I drawn near to the Achaean shore, nor yet have I set foot on mine own country but have been wandering evermore in affliction, from the day that first I went with goodly Agamemnon to Ilios of the fair steeds, to do battle with the Trojans. But come, declare me this and plainly tell it all. What doom overcame thee of death that lays men at their length? Was it a slow disease, or did Artemis the archer slay thee with the visitation of her gentle shafts? And tell me of my father and my son, that I left behind me, Doth my honour yet abide with them, or hath another already taken it, while they say that I shall come home no more? And tell me of my wedded wife, of her counsel and her purpose, doth she abide with her son, and keep all secure, or hath she already wedded the best of the Achaeans? Even so I spake, and anon my lady mother answered me, Yea verily, she abideth with steadfast spirit in thy halls, and wearily for her the nights wane always, and the days in shedding of tears. 
But the fair honor that is thine no man hath yet taken. But Telemachus sits at peace on his domain, and feasts at equal banquets, whereof it is meet that a judge partake, for all men bid him to their house. And thy father abides there in the field, and goes not down to the town, nor lies he on bedding or rugs or shining blankets, but all the winter he sleeps, where sleep the thralls in the house, in the ashes by the fire, and is clad in sorry raiment. But when the summer comes, and the rich harvest tide, his beds of fallen leaves are strewn lowly all about the knoll of his vineyard plot. There he lies sorrowing and nurses his mighty grief, for long desire of thy return, and old age withal comes heavy upon him. Yea, and even so did I too perish and meet my doom. It was not the archer goddess of the keen sight, who slew me in my halls with the visitation of her gentle shafts, nor did any sickness come upon me, such as chiefly with a sad wasting draws the spirit from the limbs, nay, it was my sore longing for thee, and for thy counsels, great Odysseus, and for thy loving kindness, that reft me of sweet life. So spake she, and I mused in my heart, and would fain have embraced the spirit of my mother dead. Thrice I sprang towards her, and was minded to embrace her, thrice she flitted from my hands as a shadow or even as a dream, and sharp grief arose ever at my heart. And uttering my voice I spake to her winged words. Mother mine, wherefore dost thou not abide me who am eager to clasp thee, that even in hates we twain may cast our arms each about the other, and have our fill of chill lament? Is this but a phantom that the high goddess Persephone hath sent me, to the end that I may groan for more exceeding sorrow? So spake I, and my lady mother answered me anon, Ah me, my child, of all men most ill-fated, Persephone, the daughter of Zeus, doth in no wise deceive thee, but even on this wise it is with mortals when they die. For the sinews no more bind together the flesh and the bones, but the great force of burning fire abolishes these, so soon as the life hath left the white bones, and the spirit like a dream flies forth and hovers near. But haste with all thine heart toward the sunlight, and mark all this, that even hereafter thou mayest tell it to thy wife. Thus we twain held discourse together, and lo, the women came up, for the high goddess Persephone sent them forth, all they that had been the wives and daughters of mighty men. And they gathered and flocked about the black blood, and I took counsel how I might question them each one. And this was the counsel that showed best in my sight. I drew my long hanger from my stalwart thigh, and suffered them not all at one time to drink of the dark blood. So they drew nigh one by one, and each declared her lineage, and I made question of all. Then verily did I first see Tyro, sprung of a noble sire, who said that she was the child of noble Salmoneus, and declared herself the wife of Cretheus, son of Aeolus. She loved a river, the divine Enipius, far the fairest of the floods that run upon the earth, and she would resort to the fair streams of Enipius. And it came to pass that the girdler of the world, the earth shaker, put on the shape of the god, and lay by the lady at the mouths of the whirling stream. Then the dark wave stood around them like a hillside bowed, and hid the god and the mortal woman. And he undid her maiden girdle, and shed a slumber over her. Now when the god had done the work of love, he clasped her hand and spake and hailed her. Woman, be glad in our love, and when the year comes round thou shalt give birth to glorious children, for not weak are the embraces of the gods, and do thou keep and cherish them. And now go home and hold thy peace, and tell it not, but behold, I am Poseidon, shaker of the earth. Therewith he plunged beneath the heaving deep. And she conceived and bare Peleus and Nellius, who both grew to be mighty men, servants of Zeus. Peleus dwelt in wide Iolcos, and was rich in flocks, and that other abode in sandy Pylos. And the queen of women bare yet other sons to Cretheus, even Aeson and Phears and Amytheon, whose joy was in chariots. And after her I saw Antiope, daughter of Asopus, and her boast was that she had slept even in the arms of Zeus, and she bare two sons, Amphion and Zethus, who founded first the place of seven-gated Thebes, and they made of it a fenced city, for they might not dwell in spacious Thebes unfenced, for all their valiancy. Next to her I saw Alcmene, wife of Amphitryon, who lay in the arms of mighty Zeus, and bare Heracles of the lion heart, steadfast in the fight. And I saw Megara, daughter of Creon, haughty of heart, whom the strong and tireless son of Amphitryon had to wife. And I saw the mother of Oedipodes, fair Epicast, who wrought a dread deed unwittingly, being wedded to her own son, and he that had slain his own father wedded her, and straightway the gods made these things known to men. Yet he abode in pain in pleasant Thebes, ruling the Cadmeans, by reason of the deadly counsels of the gods. But she went down to the house of Hades, the mighty warder, yea, she tied a noose from the high beam aloft, being fast holden in sorrow, 
while for him she left pains behind full many, even all that the avengers of a mother bring to pass. And I saw lovely Chloris, whom Nellius wedded on a time for her beauty, and brought gifts of wooing past number. She was the youngest daughter of Amphion, son of Iasus, who once ruled mightily in Minyan or Cominus. And she was queen of Pylos, and bare glorious children to her lord, Nestor and Chromius, and princely Periclimenus, and stately Pero too, the wonder of all men. All that dwelt around were her wars, but Nellius would not give her, save to him who should drive off from Phyllis the kind of mighty Ithacles, with shambling gait and broad of brow, hard cattle to drive. And none but the noble seer took in hand to drive them, but a grievous fate from the gods fettered him, even hard bonds and the herdsmen of the wild. But when at length the months and days were being fulfilled, as the year returned upon his course, and the seasons came round, then did mighty Ithacles set him free, when he had spoken out all the oracles, and herein was the counsel of Zeus being accomplished. And I saw Lead, the famous bedfellow of Tyndareus, who bare to Tyndareus two sons, Hardy of Heart, Castor Tamer of Steeds, and Polyduces the Boxer. These twain yet live, but the quickening earth is over them, and even in the nether world they have honor at the hand of Zeus. And they possess their life in turn, living one day and dying the next, and they have gotten worship even as the gods. And after her I beheld Iphimedea, bedfellow of Aluas, who said that she had lain with Poseidon, and she bare children twain, but short of life were they, godlike Otis and far-famed Ephialtes. Now these were the tallest men that earth, the grain-giver, ever reared and far the goodliest after the renowned Orion. At nine seasons old they were of breadth nine cubits and nine fathoms in height. They it was who threatened to raise even against the immortals in Olympus the din of stormy war. They strove to pile Ossa on Olympus, and on Ossa Pelion with the trembling forest leaves, that there might be a pathway to the sky. Yeah, and they would have accomplished it, had they reached the full measure of manhood. But the son of Zeus, whom Leto of the fair locks bare, destroyed the twain, ere the down had bloomed beneath their temples, and darkened their chins with the blossom of youth. And Phaedra and Procris I saw, and fair Ariadne, the daughter of wizard Minos, whom Theseus on a time was bearing from Crete to the hill of sacred Athens, yet had he no joy of her, for Artemis slew her ere that in sea girt dear, by reason of the witness of Dionys. And Mera and Clymene I saw, and hateful Eriphyle, who took fine gold for the price of her dear lord's life. But I cannot tell or name all the wives and daughters of the heroes that I saw, ere that, the immortal night would wane. Nay, it is even now time to sleep, whether I go to the swift ship to my company or abide here, and for my convoy you and the gods will care. So spake he, and dead silence fell on all, and they were spellbound throughout the shadowy halls. Then a reed of the white arms first spake among them, Phaeacians, what think you of this man for comeliness and stature, and within for wisdom of heart? Moreover he is my guest, though every one of you hath his share in this honour. Wherefore haste not to send him hence, and stint not these your gifts for one that stands in such sore need of them, for ye have much treasure stored in your halls by the grace of the gods. Then too spake among them the old man, Lord Eschenius, that was an elder among the Phaeacians, friends, behold, the speech of our wise queen is not wide of the mark, nor far from our deeming, so hearken ye thereto. But on Alcinous here both word and work depend. Then Alcinous made answer, and spake unto him, Yea, the word that she hath spoken shall hold, if indeed I am yet to live and bear rule among the Phaeacians, masters of the oar. Howbeit let the stranger, for all his craving to return, nevertheless endure to abide until the morrow, till I make up the full measure of the gift, and men shall care for his convoy, all men, but I in chief, for mine is the lordship in the land. An Odysseus of many counsels answered him, saying, My lord Alcinous, most notable of all the people, if ye bade me tarry here even for a year, and would speed my convoy and give me splendid gifts, even that I would choose, and better would it be for me to come with a fuller hand to mine own dear country, so should I get more love and worship in the eyes of all men, whoso should see me after I was returned to Ithaca. And Alcinous answered him, saying, Odysseus, in no wise do we deem thee, we that look on thee, to be a knave or a cheat, even as the dark earth rears many such broadcast, fashioning lies whence none can even see his way therein. But beauty crowns thy words, and wisdom is within thee, and thy tale, as when a minstrel sings, thou hast told with skill, the weary woes of all the Argives and of thine own self. But come, declare me this and plainly tell it all. Didst thou see any of thy godlike company who went up at the same time with thee to Ilios and there met their doom? 
Behold, the night is of great length, unspeakable, and the time for sleep in the hall is not yet, tell me therefore of those wondrous deeds. I could abide even till the bright dawn, so long as thou couldst endure to rehearse me these woes of thine in the hall. And Odysseus of many counsels answered him, saying, My lord Alcinous, most notable of all the people, there is a time for many words and there is a time for sleep. But if thou art eager still to listen, I would not for my part grudge to tell thee of other things more pitiful still, even the woes of my comrades, those that perished afterward, for they had escaped with their lives from the dread war cry of the Trojans, but perished in returning by the will of an evil woman. Now when holy Persephone had scattered this way and that the spirits of the women folk, thereafter came the soul of Agamemnon, son of Atreus, sorrowing, and round him others were gathered, the ghosts of them who had died with him in the house of Aegis thus and met their doom. And he knew me straightway when he had drunk the dark blood, yeah, and he wept aloud, and shed big tears as he stretched forth his hands in his longing to reach me. But it might not be, for he had now no steadfast strength nor power at all in moving, such as was aforetime in his supple limbs. At the sight of him I wept and was moved with compassion, and uttering my voice, spake to him winged words, Most renowned son of Atreus, Agamemnon, king of men, say what doom overcame thee of death that lays men at their length. Did Poseidon smite thee in thy ships, raising the dolorous blast of contrary winds? Or did unfriendly men do thee hurt upon the land, whilst thou wert cutting off their oxen and fair flocks of sheep, or fighting to win a city and the women thereof? So spake I, and straightway he answered, and said unto me, Son of Laertes, of the seed of Zeus, Odysseus of many devices, it was not Poseidon that smote me in my ships and raised the dolorous blast of contrary winds, nor did unfriendly men do me hurt upon the land, but Aegis thus it was that wrought me death and doom and slew me, with the aid of my accursed wife, as one slays an ox at the stall, after he had bidden me to his house, and entertained me at a feast. Even so I died by a death most pitiful, and round me my company likewise were slain without ceasing, like swine with glittering tusks which are slaughtered in the house of a rich and mighty man, whether at a wedding banquet or a joint feast or a rich clan drinking. Ere now hast thou been at the slaying of many a man, killed in single fight or in strong battle, yet thou wouldst have sorrowed the most at this sight, how we lay in the hall round the mixing bowl and the laden boards, and the floor all ran with blood. And most pitiful of all that I heard was the voice of the daughter of Priam, of Cassandra, whom hard by me the crafty Clytemnestra slew. Then I strove to raise my hands as I was dying upon the sword, but to earth they fell. And that shameless one turned her back upon me, and had not the heart to draw down my eyelids with her fingers nor to close my mouth. So surely is there naught more terrible and shameless than a woman who imagines such evil in her heart, even as she too planned a foul deed, fashioning death for her wedded lord. Verily I had thought to come home most welcome to my children and my thralls, but she, out of the depth of her evil knowledge, shed shame on herself and on all womankind, which shall be for ever, even on the upright. Even so he spake, but I answered him, saying, Lo now, in very sooth, a Zeus of the far-born voice wreaked wondrous hatred on the seed of Atreus through the counsels of woman from of old. For Helen's sake so many of us perished, and now Clytemnestra hath practiced treason against thee, while yet thou wast afar off. Even so I spake, and anon he answered me, saying, Wherefore do thou too, never henceforth be soft even to thy wife, neither show her all the counsel that thou knowest, but a part declare and let part be hid. Yet shalt not thou, Odysseus, find death at the hand of thy wife, for she is very discreet and prudent in all her ways, the wise Penelope, daughter of Icarius. Verily we left her a bride new wed when we went to the war, and a child was at her breast, who now, methinks, sits in the ranks of men, happy in his lot, for his dear father shall behold him on his coming, and he shall embrace his sire as his meat. But as for my wife, she suffered me not so much as to have my fill of gazing on my son, ere that she slew me, even her lord. And yet another thing will I tell thee, and do thou ponder it in thy heart. Put thy ship to land in secret, and not openly, on the shore of thy dear country, for there is no more faith in woman. But come, declare me this and plainly tell it all, if haply ye hear of my son as yet living, either, it may be, in Orcomenus or in Sandy Pylos, or perchance with Menelaus in wide Sparta, for goodly Orestes hath not yet perished on the earth. Even so he spake, but I answered him, saying, Son of Atreus, wherefore dost thou ask me straightly of these things? Nay I know not at all, whether he be alive or dead, it is ill to speak words light as wind. 
Thus we twain stood sorrowing, holding sad discourse, while the big tears fell fast, and that with all came the soul of Achilles, son of Peleus, and of Patroclus, and of noble Antilochus, and of Aeus, who in face and form was goodliest of all the Danans, after the noble son of Peleus. And the spirit of the son of Echus, fleet of foot, knew me again, and making lament spake to me winged words. Son of Laetz, of the seed of Zeus, Odysseus of many devices, man overbold, what new deed and hardier than this wilt thou devise in thy heart? How durst thou come down to the house of Hades, where dwell the senseless dead, the phantoms of men outworn? So he spake, but I answered him, Achilles, son of Peleus, mightiest far of the Achaeans, I am come hither to seek to Teresias, if he may tell me any counsel, how I may come to rugged Ithaca. For not yet have I come nigh the Achaean land, nor set foot on mine own soil, but am still in evil case, while as for thee, Achilles, none other than thou wast heretofore the most blessed of men, nor shall any be hereafter. For of old, in the days of thy life, we Argives gave thee one honour with the gods, and now thou art a great prince here among the dead. Wherefore let not thy death be any grief to thee, Achilles. Even so I spake, and he straightway answered me, and said, Nay, speak not comfortably to me of death, O great Odysseus. Rather would I live on ground as the hireling of another, with a landless man who had no great livelihood, than bear sway among all the dead that be departed. But come, tell me tidings of that lordly son of mine, did he follow to the war to be a leader or not? And tell me of noble Peleus, if thou hast heard aught, is he yet held in worship among the Myrmidons, or do they dishonour him from Hellas to Thyre, for that old age binds him hand and foot? For I am no longer his champion under the sun, so mighty a man as once I was, when in wide Troy I slew the best of the host, and succoured the Argives. Ah! Could I but come for an hour to my father's house as then I was, so would I make my might and hands invincible, to be hateful to many and one of those who do him despite and keep him from his honour. Even so he spake, but I answered him saying, As for noble Peleus, verily I have heard naught of him, but concerning thy dear son Neoptolemus, I will tell thee all the truth, according to thy word. It was I that led him up out of Syros in my good hollow ship, in the wake of the goodly grieved Achaeans. Now oft as we took counsel around Troy town, he was ever the first to speak, and no word missed the mark, the godlike Nestor and I alone surpassed him. But whensoever we Achaeans did battle on the plain of Troy, he never tarried behind in the throng or the press of men, but ran out far before us all, yielding to none in that might of his. And many men he slew in warfare dread, but I could not tell of all or name their names, even all the host he slew in succoring the Argives, but, ah, how he smote with the sword that son of Telephus, the hero Eurypolis, and many Cetians of his company were slain around him, by reason of a woman's bribe. He truly was the comeliest man that ever I saw, next to goodly Memnon. And again when we, the best of the Argives, were about to go down into the horse which Epius wrought, and the charge of all was laid on me, both to open the door of our good ambush and to shut the same. Then did the other princes and counsellors of the Danans wipe away the tears, and the limbs of each one trembled beneath him, but never once did I see thy son's fair face wax pale, nor did he wipe the tears from his cheeks, but he besought me often to let him go forth from the horse, and kept handling his sword hilt and his heavy bronze shot spear, and he was set on mischief against the Trojans. But after we had sacked the steep city of Priam, he embarked unscathed with his share of the spoil, and with a noble prize, he was not smitten with the sharp spear, and got no wound in close fight, and many such chances there be in war, for us raggeth confusedly. So I spake, and the spirit of the son of Echus, fleet of foot, passed with great strides along the mead of Asphodel, rejoicing in that I had told him of his son's renown. But lo, other spirits of the dead that be departed stood sorrowing, and each one asked of those that were dear to them. The soul of Aeus, son of Telamon, alone stood apart being still angry for the victory wherein I prevailed against him, in the suit by the ships concerning the arms of Achilles, that his lady mother had set for a prize, and the sons of the Trojans made a ward and Pallas a theme. Would that I had never prevailed and won such a prize! So goodly a head of the earth closed over, for the sake of those arms, even over Aeus, who in beauty and in feats of war was of a mould above all the other Danans, next to the noble son of Peleus. To him then I spake softly, saying, Aeus, son of noble Telamon, so art thou not even in death to forget thy wrath against me, by reason of those arms accursed, which the gods set to be the bane of the Argives. What a tower of strength fell in thy fall, and we Achaeans cease not to sorrow for thee, even as for the life of Achilles, son of Peleus. 
Nay, there is none other to blame, but Zeus, who hath borne wondrous hate to the army of the Dane and spearsmen, and laid on thee thy doom. Nay, come hither, my lord, that thou mayest hear my word and my speech, master thy wrath and thy proud spirit. So I spake, but he answered me not a word and passed to Erebus after the other spirits of the dead that be departed. Even then, despite his anger, would he have spoken to me or I to him, but my heart within me was minded to see the spirits of those others that were departed. There then I saw Minos, glorious son of Zeus, wielding a golden scepter, giving sentence from his throne to the dead, while they sat and stood around the prince, asking his dooms through the wide-gated house of Hades. And after him I marked the mighty Orion driving the wild beasts together over the mead of Asphodel, the very beasts that himself had slain on the lonely hills, with a strong mace all of bronze in his hands, that is ever unbroken. And I saw Titios, son of renowned earth, lying on a leveled ground, and he covered nine roods as he lay, and vultures twain beset him one on either side, and gnawed at his liver, piercing even to the call, but he drave them not away with his hands. For he had dealt violently with Leto, the famous bedfellow of Zeus, as she went up to Pytho through the fair lawns of Panopeus. Moreover I beheld Tantalus in grievous torment, standing in a mere, and the water came nigh unto his chin. And he stood straining as one athirst, but he might not attain to the water to drink of it. For often as that old man stooped down in his eagerness to drink, so often the water was swallowed up and it vanished away, and the black earth still showed at his feet, for some god parched it evermore. And tall trees flowering shed their fruit overhead, pears and pomegranates and apple trees with bright fruit, and sweet figs and olives in their bloom, whereat when that old man reached out his hands to clutch them, the wind would toss them to the shadowy clouds. Yea and I beheld Sisyphus in strong torment, grasping a monstrous stone with both his hands. He was pressing thereat with hands and feet, and trying to roll the stone upward toward the brow of the hill. But oft as he was about to hurl it over the top, the weight would drive him back, so once again to the plain rolled the stone, the shameless thing. And he once more kept heaving and straining, and the sweat the while was pouring down his limbs, and the dust rose upwards from his head. And after him I described the mighty Heracles, his phantom, I say, but as for himself he hath joy at the banquet among the deathless gods, and hath to wife heave of the fair ankles, child of great Zeus, and of here of the golden sandals. And all about him there was a clamour of the dead, as it were fowls flying every way in fear, and he like black knight, with bow uncased, and shaft upon the string, fiercely glancing around, like one in the act to shoot. And about his breast was an awful belt, a baldric of gold, whereon wondrous things were wrought, bears and wild boars and lions with flashing eyes, and strife and battles and slaughters and murders of men. Nay, now that he hath fashioned this, never another may he fashion, who so stored in his craft the device of that belt. And anon he knew me when his eyes beheld me, and making lament he spake unto me winged words. Son of Lets, of the seed of Zeus, Odysseus of many devices, ah! Wretched one, dost thou too lead such a life of evil do, as I endured beneath the rays of the sun? I was the son of Zeus Cronian, yet had I trouble beyond measure, for I was subdued unto a man far worse than I. And he enjoined on me hard adventures, yet and on a time he sent me hither to bring back the hound of hell, for he devised no harder task for me than this. I lifted the hound and brought him forth from out of the house of Hades, and Hermes sped me on my way and the grey-eyed Athene. Therewith he departed again into the house of Hades, but I abode there still, if perchance some one of the hero folk besides might come, who died in old time. Yea and I should have seen the men of old, whom I was fain to look on, Theseus and Perithus, renowned children of the gods. But ere that might be the myriad tribes of the dead thronged up together with wondrous clamour, and pale fear gat hold of me, lest the high goddess Persephone should send me the head of the Gorgon, that dread monster, from out of Hades. Straightway then I went to the ship, and bade my men mount the vessel, and loose the hawsers. So speedily they went on board, and sat upon the benches. And the wave of the flood bore the bark down the stream of Oceanus, we rowing first, and afterwards the fair wind was our convoy. Thank you for watching.